Masechet Baba Kama, Daf Yod Tet. We saw a series of questions by Rava, and now we'll see a couple of dilemmas by Rav Asher, and then by other sages as well. Ba'ay Rav Asher, Yesh shinui lisrorot lirbiya nezek, or en shinui lisrorot lirbiya nezek. We, or we saw above that uh, if an animal is walking in a normal way, in other words, a regel, and it is shutanizak, and as he's walking normally, if he breaks, if he smashes something, steps on something, you have to have, have to pay full amount. But if it's indirect because he causes pebbles to fly out, then he would pay half. Fine, that's for a regel, a normal way of walking. But what if it's with shinui, meaning keren? He's doing a, an unusual behavior. And that unusual behavior, if he did it, that caused uh, something directly, like goring, then he would already he would pay half. What if that in the, that unusual behavior behavior caused pebbles to fly out and indirectly break something? Would you combine the two principles of unusual that she knew and indirect, and therefore pay a half of a half? Or do you not combine these two principles and therefore it doesn't matter if it's a usual or unusual activity, it doesn't matter if it's regel or keren, if it's pebbles, pebbles always pays half uh, no matter what and never a quarter. That's the Rav Asher's question. We answer, Tifshot le midrava, de ba'e rava, yesh ha'ada'a lisrodot, o en ha'ada'a lisrodot, mikalal de en shinui. We could answer Rav Rav Asher's question from the fact that Rava asked his question that we saw yesterday, because Rava asked, is there a distinction between tam and mu'ad when it comes to pebbles, or there is no distinction? In other words, when we say that someone pays half amount for pebbles, is that only the first three times? Um, uh, and then the fourth time, they'd have to pay a full amount? Or there's no such thing as mu'ad for serot, and there would be no distinction, he pays half all the time. Now we can derive from this that there is no distinction between uh, doing it in a usual or unusual way. Because if it were, and in, uh, if there was a distinction, and one would be liable to pebbles, uh, for a quarter, well then, it wouldn't make sense for Rava to ask this question, because if it applies to something unusual, that's Keren, well Keren, there is a distinction between Tam and Mu'ad, and surely the answer would be, yes, of course, there is a distinction between Tam and Mu'ad. From the fact that Rava asked this question, means that he thinks that there is no distinction, because it's uh, it's Keren, and Keren, or Regel, Sirarot, one would pay half the amount, uh, no matter what, and never a quarter. And that's why it makes sense to ask, well, since there's no, disti- since it's, there's no distinction because of Shinui, well, but it is half. So then uh, the question is, should we, uh, does it matter if it's uh, uh, the f- first three times or, or, or not? Is there a distinction between Tam and Mu'ad? But this question would only make sense if um, the, you, you don't combine the two principles. So it's can't we answer? We figure out the answer that uh, there is no uh, there is no distinction between regel and keren uh, from the fact that Rava asked this question, and we say not necessarily. actually wasn't sure about either question, and says, listen, maybe. You'd pay a quarter if it was done with uh, with Kedin. Um, uh, may, maybe, maybe not. But if you, if you think right, so maybe it maybe yes. And, and if you think that there is, uh, you never pay a quarter. That you only always pay a half. There's no distinction between uh, regel and Kedin for pebbles. Well, then I would ask a follow up question. Um, does it matter if it's Tam or Mu'ad that it did uh, through pebbles uh, three times or more? And so that so that was a follow up question. But really, we cannot answer the Rav Asher's question from Rav's dilemma, and take away to leave Rav Asher's question standing. Next, Ba'e Rav Asher, Koach Koho, the Sumchus Ke Koho Dame, or La. Sumchus says that if uh, um, a cow causes pebbles to fly out, you have to pay not half, but you have to pay a full amount. Okay, but what about if it's a, a double action? Uh, pebbles fly out and break one thing, and then that thing has a shard that flies out and breaks uh, something else, right? A second order indirect causation. Um, uh, in that case, is that also an extension of the 
force of the animal and therefore he has to pay full amount or not only the first time uh, the first indirect causation is from the force of the animal and he has to pay full amount but maybe the second order causation is not so and therefore is half uh, half amount uh, that's the question of our second question we elaborate on the two sides of the dilemma we learned before to explain the Rabbanan against Umchus that why would they say pay a half you know either um, either this is caused by the force of the animal should pay all or not and then should pay nothing why would you want to pay why, why would what's the logic of paying half um, and we answered this is a halacha Sinai, right and that that just explains that's why you pay half so um, did they have a sumchos did sumchos he, he also have a tradition halacha Hashem Sinai, uh, but he applies it not to the first causation, but rather only to the second causation, and therefore this first causation you have to pay full amount, second one half. Or maybe he doesn't accept this oral tradition at all, and we leave this standing also, take all. Now we go back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah taught that if an animal was kicking, that's an unusual way of walking. It uh, seems to intend to uh, to cause damage. So this is um, this is a subcategory of keren, and so you pay half because it's kicking. And then it says, or uh, if it, uh, pebbles were flying out from under its feet, and we're going to have to figure out when it's walking in this in this case is it kicking or regular walking uh, and it broke uh, and it broke something the pebbles cause cause damage and uh, both of these cases one pays only half now we're going to try to figure out how do we understand the second case here there's two ways to uh, figure it out the first way to read it is two completely separate cases um, either that it's walking in an un, uh, in a kicking in an unusual way and that's why it's paying half the amount half the amount or the second one is it's walking in a normal way um, but the pebbles are flying out and for pebbles even if you're walking in a normal way you pay half the amount according to Rabbanan Rabbanan who argued with some chus so we're two two completely separate cases and they're chasinezik for two different reasons one because it's um it's keren unusual and second because it's indirect it's serorot that's all one way of reading it according to Rabbanan the second way to read it is more continuously. And the one is that it was kicking and it damaged something when it was kicking. Yeah, then as as uh, as we said, you pay half nezik because that's keren. Or the second case is assuming also that it's kicking, like the first case, and just adding that it has pebbles that are flying out because it is kicking. One also pays hasinezik. Why? Because it's unusual, not because it's um, not because of pebbles, but only because it's unusual. And therefore, we can infer that if it was walking in a normal way, it would pay one would pay a full amount, and that is the opinion of Sumchos. So we can read this whole thing according to Rabbanan, or we can read this Mishnah according to Sumchos. Um, two seemingly valid ways to read it. Can we figure out which one is correct? Tashema misefa. Well, look at the continuation of the Mishnah where it says, Darsa ala keli ushvara tu. Nefal hashebed al keli acher ushvara. Ala rishon meshalem nezik shalem. Vala haron hasi nezik. Visum chus. Mi it le hasi nezik. Here is a case where an animal is walking normally and stepped on one vessel and broke it. And uh, as it broke, uh, a shard flew off from that first vessel and damaged a second vessel. And the law is, for the first one, he has to pay a full amount because that's just from normal way of walking. And for the second, only half because that's pebbles. Um, now, if it's sumchus, does sumchus ever say that one pays half amount for half amount for pebbles? He should pay the full amount, both for the first one that broke and for the second one that broke. So this proves that it's not sumchus. Hold on. Actually, we could explain this, even this clause, according to sumchus, 
if we understand that there's actually three vessels that are being broken. And when it says Rishon, it means the first one that's broken by, by a flying shard. And then, so, uh, and then that vessel ha- has another shard that breaks a third vessel. In other words, the animal steps on one vessel, breaks it in a normal way. So yeah, for sure you're going to pay a, a full amount. And then a shard from there breaks a second vessel. And some chos would surely say that you pay 100% for that because that's, that's a, a single order uh, pebbles and you pay a full amount. But then that vessel, something flies out and, and damages is a third. And uh, according to this, a sumchos does make a distinction between the first step and two steps. For, for, for one step, he has to pay a full amount, but if it's koach kocha, something that's from the force, of the force of the animal, then you'd pay 50%. And therefore, actually, you could explain this entire Mishnah according to Sumchos. But that would be a problem because if you explain it like that, But Rav that we had this question above, uh, asked about this very question, does Sumchos have to say that you have to pay, um, you can pay 50% when it's a double order or not, and we left it as a teko and he couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. We didn't have an answer. Um, uh, why didn't we derive it from here that, look, if this Mishnah is uh, is like Somchos, uh, then we would be able to prove that the second vessel, you pay only 50%. From the fact that we did not uh, the, the, we did not answer Rav Asher's question, means that this is an incorrect reading. And we answer, Rav Asher, moki la uba'e la hachi. No, it could be Rav Asher leaves the question open because he is interpreting the dilemma that we just talk about, uh, talked about um, of this clause of the Mishnah. He's interpreting that dilemma to be all within Rabbanan. And so he's not even bringing some chos into it. In other words, we know that there's some t- subtype of discussion about this Mishnah in two ways. And before we said either you can read it, um, depending on how you read those two clauses, as uh, um, as continuous or not, and then it would be according to Rabbanan or Sumchos. And then we said, well, if you interpret it that way and um, and you follow Sumchos, then it would follow that Sumchos says you pay 50% for the second order uh, causation. Um, but, and then we would have an answer. But from the fact that Rav Hashem doesn't cite all, cite all that, it must mean that the question that we had about the Mishnah has to be different and is all within Rabbanan and therefore has nothing to do with Sumchos at all. And so what's the question within Rabbanan. Here's two ways to read the Mishnah within Rabbanan. As follows. If it was kicking and caused damage by kicking, well then you pay half because that's an unusual. Or if it was walking normally and causes cause pe- and, and send pebbles, also you'd pay chasinezek because this is Rabbanan. And the inference we could make of this being right two separate, uh, completely separate cases is that if it were kicking and sent pebbles, then you'd pay a quarter because yes, you do combine shinui, uh, unusual walking with pebbles, and that would be a half of a half. That's one way of reading it. Or the other way to read the Mishnah is that the first case is it's kicking and causes damage, and so that's unusual, and that's why it's chasinezik. And the second case is continuing that is kicking, and it's also also uh, sends pebbles, and it causes damage by kicking and pebbles. And nevertheless, he still pays chasinezik because. Um, you do not combine the two things, and for all cases of pebbles, whether it's walking normally or it's uh, or it's doing something unusual, all cases of pebbles are uh, payment of fifty percent, and you never pay a quarter. And that's the two ways of reading the Mishnah. That was our question, and so that we leave standing. But in fact, that has nothing to do with sumchus, and therefore we cannot use this uh, these two readings to answer Rav Asher's question. Uh, these are um, uh, other two readings that are all within Rabbanan. Next, we have another dilemma about pebbles. So, Rabbi Abba asks this question from someone. If an animal is walking in a place where it's impossible for it not to uh, uh, send pebbles flying, like uh, some narrow path and has a lot of pebbles on it, and just walking by walking regular, 
uh, um, automatically uh, they're going to fly out, and sure enough, a pebble flies out and causes damage. What do we say about that case? Do we say that since there has no other way for it to, to walk, and there's not for sure not necessarily going to send up pebbles, so that's called a typical way of walking, and therefore is a typical way of walking uh, together with pebbles, and so he'd pay half. Uh, or do we say that nevertheless he is still kicking because um, that uh, even though there's no other way to walk than to kick pebbles, nevertheless is still kicking, and, and this is, would be considered an unusual way of walking. And then if you combine the two of uh, uh, unusual plus uh, pebbles, maybe you'd pay a quarter. Uh, so how do we categorize it? And we leave this question standing. For animals walking now in Rishut Rabim. Until now, we were assuming most cases we took that the pebbles was in Rishut Yachid, and it's under Regel, Regel, you're a liable full amount, and Rishut Yachid, and then pebbles is half, half the amount. But what if this happened in a public domain? It kicked Uba'ata. Now, this word is actually quite problematic. And in fact, if we look at the uh, manuscripts, we see that the word Uba'ata is found only in printed editions, but in none of the manuscripts. So this word is a mistake. It should not, does not belong here. Uh, if the animal is walking in the Shutar Abim, not kicking, but rather normally. Ah, uh, okay. And it's walking normally in the Abim, and a, throw, a, a pebble flies out while it's walking and causes damage. That's the question. Uh, do we consider pebbles to be a tolada of keren, um, uh, of uh, something you know flying out in an un, uh, uh, unusual way? And therefore, just like an animal is hayav keren, have to pay half, um, it's similar also because you pay half. So maybe there's a, um, a, a fundamental similarity between keren and pebbles because you pay half in both of them. So that would make sense. It's a tolad, if it's a tolada of keren, then you have to pay for damage of pebbles also in the Rishut Rabim. Or maybe it's a tolada of regel, right? This is a, a normal way of walking. Uh, and, uh, and then sometimes pebbles fly out and this is a subcategory. And the regel one is liable only in someone else's property. Yeah, even though the animal's walking normally, it's not doing anything strange, but who asked you to walk in someone else's property and trample over things? So you're liable for that 100%, and you'd be liable for pebbles under Egel. But Egel, you are not liable in the Shuterabim. Shuterabim, that's kind of by definition, this is a permission for the public. Everyone can walk here, and you can't, don't leave things lying around where they're going to get trampled on. And therefore, if it's a tol adav regel, and just like regel is patur and shutar abim, also pebbles are patur and shutar abim. So that's the funda- really fundamental question. This whole thing about pebbles was only in the shutar nizak, we know is, uh, would be hayav, that would be half. But in the shutar abim, is it the same, or are you totally patur? He says, it makes sense, that would be a subcategory of walking, right? It's a normal way of walking, and then sometimes when you walk, a pebble flies out, like sometimes when you drive, you drive over a puddle, and it splashes something, but that's a normal way of driving, and therefore, um, you got to be careful of uh, pebbles flying in the Shutar Abim. That happens, don't leave things lying around, that can be damaged by uh, pebbles, just like you wouldn't, uh, go near a puddle if you know that cars are walk are, are driving by. It's not the car's fault. It's just it's that's the normal way to drive. All uh, right. So, um, so that's the answer. You would not pay for pebbles in the Rishut Harabim. Follow up question. Okay. What if animals walking in normal way? In the public domain, and the pebble flies out. Okay, that's fine. It's a normal thing to do, but it flies all the way into someone else's property and causes damage in their property. Oh, so now what do we do? Do we look at the where it originated or where it did the damage? If where it originated, then patur. But if it where did where where it did the damage? That's the shoot on Isaac. Then you'd be liable half. And the Rebbe Zera answers, listen, there was no lifting, therefore there is no placing. If I'm not responsible for the kicking part of going up in the air, then I'm not responsible for where it lands either. Not my problem. It doesn't matter if it lands in the Shuta Rabim or the Shuta Yechid. The owner of the ox is not liable. Okay, so far so good. We're going to have uh, three challenges. It'll be a 
is going to ask on the Bezera. Itibe. Haitam alechet baderech, behitiza, ben beshut hayechid, ben beshut rabim, hayav, my love itiza beshut rabim, vizika beshut rabim. Here we have an explicit braita that says if an animal is walking on the way and it uh, sends pebbles flying, and it doesn't matter whether it's in a private domain or a public domain, the owner is liable. So simply, it seems like it's talking about a case where it flies out in the Shut Rabim, and it causes damage in the Shut Rabim, and that would challenge Rabbi Zera's first statement that it's, that it's like under Regel. And we answer, La, hitiza b'shut rabim, vizika b'shut ha'echid. No, this case is talking about where, yes, it flew out in the Shut Rabim, but the damage was caused in the Shut ha'echid. That's why he's liable. But if it caused damage within the Shut Rabim, it would be like, like totally like Regel and would be patur. All right, fine. That that um, it resolves Rabbi Zera's first statement, but now it challenges his second statement. Hamat akira in kan hanacha yesh kan. But you also said that if there is no flat lifting, if I'm not if I'm not uh, liable, if I'm not responsible for sending it flying. I'm also not responsible for where it lands, and therefore. He should be patur even if it lands in the Shuta Yachid. Amale Hadri Bir Vizera says, I changed my mind. You're right. That's what I thought. I, 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 I thought that it should be okay, uh, the court because of this logic. If I didn't if I'm not responsible for sending it flying, I'm not responsible for where it lands, but now I changed my mind. And once he changed he's not changing his mind about the first statement, only about the second statement. And so according to the new Rabbi Zera, um, if it lands in the Shut Rabim, um Patur is Regel, but if it lands in the Shut Yachid, well that's already the Shut Nizak, and I am liable. Okay, we ask, have another challenge. Itibe. Darsa ala keli ushbaratu, venafala sheber al keli acher ushbaro, ala rishom mishalem ezek shalem, ala chom mishalem tasi nezek. This is the Mishnah that we've seen already that says, if an animal's walking and steps on one um, vessel and breaks it, and that broken vessel, a shard of it goes out flying and breaks a second vessel. So for the first one, he has to pay a full amount uh, because that's uh, that's uh, um, that's normal regel. We're talking about in the shuta nizak, um, and then for the second one, only half because that's pebbles. And now that's the Mishnah. We have a Braita on Evetani Alevemim, I remember him Shuta Nizak, I was Shuta Rabim, Al Rishon Pitura Valacharon Hayevet. That's only if it's in Shuta Rabim for the first one, Patur, because it would just smash the whilst walking. Regel is Patur in Shuta Rabim. But for the second one, you do have to pay. Seems, right? This is the same as pebbles, and saying for pebbles in the Shuta Rabim, you have to pay. It might be chasinezik, but you still have to pay. My love, he tiza b'rishut harabim, v'izika b'rishut harabim. Is this not talking about a case where it flew out in public domain and it broke something in public domain? And this challenges Rabbi Zera's first, uh, first answer. Lo, he tiza b'rishut harabim, v'izika b'rishut harabim. No, it's not a case where it was sent flying in the public domain, but it flew to someone's private domain, and then there is shut nizak, and also pebbles in shut nizak. That's where he would have to pay half. Hold on, hold on, you said that if I'm not responsible for it flying, I'm not responsible for where it lands. Yeah, I, I changed my mind about that. I already told you I changed my mind. Um, so yeah, you're right. Uh, it, uh, the one is chayav, or it's only patur. If it lands in shut rabim, if it lands in shut hayachid, chayav. Yini. Third question. Rabbi Yochanan says there's no difference when you're paying half half amount. There's no difference between the shut and the shut What cases are talking about? My love, it is it is a b'shut rabim, vizika b'shut rabim. Is it not where the animal's walking in a normal way in the public domain and it breaks something in public domain, and still says there's no difference? So that means that uh, just like you would be liable in private domain b'shut anizak, you'd also be liable here. So, this, so therefore, it is liable. Challenge to the Bizarra's first statement. No, Rabbi Yochanan meant um, that uh, the damage uh, goes from the Shut Rabim to the Shut Achid. That's why one is liable. But if it and, and uh, uh, if it takes off and lands in the Shut Rabim, then we patur that's consistent with the Yochanan. Hold on, Vamat Akira and Kanan Achayesh Kan. Wait, what Rabbi Zara? You said they keep uh, bothering him. What? Say he can't he can't get out from under it. Once he said this thing, he has to keep retracting it. Okay, it sounds like uh, it, uh, although it's not necessarily true that this is a continuous flow of a, of a conversation because otherwise he already said he retracted it twice. We have to say we have to say it again. Uh, but rather it could be that. Um, he, he retracted it once, but now we're applying that retraction to all the cases that he would have to say, I retract. That doesn't mean that this is a uh, word-for-word 
uh, a, 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 a stenographer cupping down this the conversation as it happened. Okay, I'm Ale Hadri B. So you're right. I changed my mind about that. And in fact, if it goes into Shuta uh yes, it would be Hayab, and that's what Rabbi Yochanan meant. Or another answer. When the Yochanan said the statement that there's no difference between the Shuta Nabim and Shuta Achid for Chasi Nezik, he wasn't talking about a payment of Chasi Nezik for pebbles, he was talking about payment of a chassin nezik because of keren, that goring, um, uh, one pays, if it's a short time, one pays a half amount, and for that he was saying that, both, that applies both in the shu te'achid and the shu te'rabim, uh, not like Rabbi Tarfan, uh, it applies, uh, everyone agrees it applies in the shu te'rabim, and it also applies in the shu te'achid, he wasn't talking about pebbles at all, and therefore, this, uh, the, the, the Rabbi Yochanan uh, statement has no relevance to it, I think it's kind of fascinating that we're given Iba'at Emma, even though we already established that he changed his mind. He definitely changed his mind, but uh, why did he need another answer if he definitely changed his mind? The second answer sounds like, well, maybe he doesn't have to change his mind, right? And so even after emphasizing so many times that there's no way he, he uh, continued in that opinion, we end off with, oh, well, a possibility that maybe he did. Okay, the grandson of Yehuda, Nesi, and the Oshaya, were um, uh, standing at the uh, at the entrance of uh, Rabbi Yehuda's house, and the fact when they're discussing some things of his own house, Rabbi Yehuda Nesia, and they're discussing some matters, and the following question came up. The question is, if an animal uh, swishes its tail. It does that sometimes, and it breaks something as it's switching its, switching its tail. What is it? Are you liable or not? And the other one said, what, what do you want the owner to do? Hold on to the tail uh, the whole time while it's walking? Right? There's no, nothing he could do to prevent it. So you can't make him pay. And the other responded, well, if so, then with the horns also, the owner, owner, your owner could say, well, what, what was I supposed to do? How could I prevent it from goring? Do I have to hold its horns the whole time? And yet, regarding goring, one is liable. And so, too, regarding uh, 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 swishing a tail, you should also be liable, even though it's very, very difficult to prevent. Okay, that's the discussion. Now we say, Hachi hashta? Wait a second, why are you comparing a t- swishing a tail to goring with horns? Keren la ha It's unusual for an animal to go and gore something with its horns, only if it gets really upset and uh, uh, um, angry. Uh, but swishing a tail, that's a normal behavior. And therefore, um, if it's normal behavior, then it follows the laws. If it's in the Shuta Yachid, one should be liable for normal behavior. Uh, okay, if it's, if it's really it's normal behavior, then what kind of question are you, why are you even asking the question? Right? So this is, it's doing things that's normal behavior, and therefore in the Shuta Rabim will be Patur, the Shuta Yachid will be Chayav. And the answer is, Kishkush Yeterami Ba'yale. We're talking about when it's not swinging, the normal swinging a little bit, but excessive swishing of its tail and so this is on the borderline of being usual and unusual and that's the question that they were asking um, how should we categorize it okay follow-up question by Rav Aina Kishkishka Ba'amata Mahu if an animal a male animal is walking and swinging its male member and that breaks something as it's doing so do we say that this is a subcategory of keren? Why? Because what prompts an animal to go and gore something? Its inclination overcomes it. It gets aroused and, and you know, feelings of anger and wants to go and uh, gore something. And here also it's feeling aroused. That's why it's, uh, his male member is breaking things. And so uh, both, are, uh, both are a result of feelings of arousal. And therefore, it's the same as keren. It would have all the laws the same as keren. Or, well, still quite different because regarding Keren, it's angry and wants to break something. Um, that's its intention. It wants to be violent and break something. But here, um, it's aroused in a different way, not in anger. Um, and so therefore, it has, has no intention to break something. And therefore, it's not the same as Keren. Teko, we leave that question standing. 
The last part of the Mishnah teaches a chicken that is walking in a normal way and breaks something, so that's considered mu'ad. And then it goes on and says if a string is tied to the chicken's leg and it breaks a vessel by the string flying off and knocking into something, uh, then that he has to pay half damage. That's the same as pebbles. Um, it's not the chicken itself, not the body, its own body, uh, but rather the string that it is attached to it um, then goes and breaks something, so he pays half damage. Um, Ravuna says seemingly about this Mishnah, although later we're going to question maybe if maybe he said it independently. Um, but if he said it about this Mishnah, then he said then it means that this is only true that he pays Chatzin Nezik if it got tied on its own. Right? There was a lying around like like pebbles that are just there. And the uh, chicken got caught in it, and uh, then uh, he uh, then he uh, he pushed it, and it went and broke something. Uh, then the owner of the chicken has to pay half. But if someone else came and deliberately tied the string to the chicken, and then it's walking around and it causes damage, that would be a subcategory of a pit. That's an item that is liable to cause damage, even though it's moving around. This could still be a pit, and the and the person who tied it on there. Is liable. Now we ask, if it got tied on its own, who exactly would be liable? Is it the owner of the string? Like someone dropped a string uh, somewhere and it got tied on its own. And so is it that, uh, the owner of the string? Well, how, how, what, what happened there? If the owner of the string put it away in a safe place and somehow the chicken went to that, into that you know, safe place and got, stu- and, and got caught on it, and then it caused damage. Well, the owner of the string is uh, beyond his control. It's not his fault. And if the owner of the string was not careful with it and left it out, and then the chicken came and uh, got caught in it, and then went and pushed it, and it went and broke something, well, then the owner of the string is definitely fully liable. He's too negligent and should have to pay a full amount, not half. And so we, if it's the owner of the string that has to pay, we can't explain the half payment. Rather, it must be that the owner of the chicken is the one has to pay half. Well, why doesn't the owner of the chicken have to pay a full amount? Well, because the Pasuk says regarding board, only if a human being opens, uh, digs a board, then he is liable. But if an animal digs a board, uh, my animal digs a board, then I don't have to pay, only if I'm directly responsible for the board, not if it, my animal digs a board. Um, so I don't have to pay. That's true for, for regarding not only full payment, but also half payment. We would apply the same logic, only if a person digs a board himself, but not if he pay, not if the animal digs it, he, should, he pays nothing. And in this case, uh, the owner of the chicken, this the chicken that made the board, um, the board in the form of a, of a string, and the and then uh, therefore the owner of the chicken should not be responsible at all, not ha- not even half payment. So what's the case? Rather, the Mishnah is talking about where the chicken moved the string. Um, it's not that it caused damage while it was attached to it, but rather that it moved it and it, and then it flew out and broke something. And uh, therefore, it's the same as pebbles, um, right? And so, so, and that's why he has to pay half damage. It doesn't matter who owns it, uh, who owns the string, just like it doesn't matter who owns the pebbles. Um, it was just there. And uh, it, it causes damage indirectly, not when it's touching the, the, the chicken. And so that's the case, and that's why it's half damages, same as pebbles. Um, and Rav Huna was not actually talking about this particular Mishnah when he said his statement, um, but rather he said in general, If there's a string that's a hefked, it's just the middle of the street, and it gets tied onto a chicken um, uh, uh, on its own, um, it just gets tied on and then causes someone to trip over it or so causes something to break, uh, then the owner of the chicken is patur. But if the person, if the uh, someone comes and deliberately ties it onto the chicken, that person would be hayav for full cost. So this explains why we don't have, we don't have, now we don't have to explain 
why half why it's half damage it, half damage will only be if it's regard if it's a case of pebbles um but when i was not talking about half damage but rather zero or all and there that's where he said it depends on if it got tied on on its own or if someone tied on purposely mishum my chayav and why would he be liable if he tied on the string purposely this is a subcategory of board it's a moving board a standard board a pit is just something that is stationary that i i put it there but there is such a thing as a pit that is moving around and it's attached to the feet of a person or the hooves of an animal and that's also a subcategory of pit and if i purposely put a dangerous thing attach it to a person or uh, an animal and it causes damage so then the person who did that uh, that's basically the same as opening a pit is liable for 100 percent of the damage matnitin kesad hashen mo'edet next mishnah uh, describing the case of shen an animal that uh, causes damage by eating and uh, is forewarned uh, how does it happen only if it eats uh, food that it normally eats this is a a, a normal type of damage and here's an example uh, an animal is considered forewarned if it's eating fruits and vegetables right these domesticated animals are herbivorous if on the other hand an animal goes and uh, eats uh, 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 garments or vessels that's unusual and therefore that would be under keren and we would pay only half damage when does one have to pay the uh, shen, a full, full amount of shen, when it does it something normally? That's only if it's in the private domain of the nizak. But if it's in the Rishut Rabim, the owner of the ox doesn't pay anything. Uh, because what are you doing leaving your food and stuff around um, in the Rishut Rabim? They don't pay anything at all. This is a normal behavior for animals to go and eat food that it sees. However, if the animal does derive benefit, um, even in the Shutarabim, then the owner does have to pay the amount that it derived benefit. Uh, so this is not damages, but just simply that, well, my animal ate something, and so I should pay you for what it ate because it's just I owe you that. Now, the difference between what it benefited and the damage can be significant, right? If um, you have a, a very fancy uh, pasta dish that costs you $50, and now my animal comes and eats it, now, my, for my animal, the benefit was not $50. It would be just as happy with some, uh, you know, cheap grains and it would get the same calories. So from, from, from my perspective, it benefited about $2 worth. But the damage to you is going to be $50. So therefore, if that happens in Rishu Tanizaki, went into your house and ate your fancy pasta, I have to pay you back what it costs. Fifty dollars, but if it's in the shoot uh, so what are you doing? Leaving your food lying around in the shoot You know that the animals around. Uh, therefore, I do not have to pay for the damage. But my animal did benefit a couple of dollars of worth of food, and therefore I have to pay only what it benefited. Kesad mishalemet mashenehenet. What's an example of it uh, paying for that which it derives benefit from? Achla mitoch adachava mishalemet mashenehenet. Misedar chava mishalemet mashehizika. It's going to now to give distinctions between the shut rabim and shut hayachid. If it eats something in the public square, I only have to pay that which it benefited. Uh, but if it if he ate from the, from the side of the public domain, the side of it, that uh, on the side people do what will you know stay there and put their things there for a while. So that's kind of like the shoot hayachid. It's a temporary the shoot hayachid that you're you know um, um, I'm sitting there and putting your stuff and doing uh, your private business on the side. And in that case, the mammal goes over there and cause and eats something. Then I have to pay for the full damage. I'm um, just like if you go to the shuk today, you have these uh, stores and the store owners put their wares out. out they extend it out into the walkway into the public domain. So if my animal comes in, take some uh, olives that you put in a container out in the front in the Shutarabim, so then I only have to pay you for the amount that it benefited from, a lesser amount. But if my animal goes into the store itself, that's the Shutarachid, then I have to pay the full amount of damage. Gemara elaborates to Nurabanan. Hashin mo'edit lechol tarauy la kesad. And how do we, uh, what are cases where the animal's forewarned to eat that which it is fitting to eat? 
בהמה שנכנסה לחסר לנזק, ואכלה אוכלין הראויים לה, ושתתה משכין הראויים לה, משלם נזק שלם. If an animal, this domesticated animal that are herbivorous, all domesticated animals are herbivorous, and it goes into someone's private domain and eats that which, that which it usually eats, or drinks that the things that it usually drinks, then the owner has to pay full amount. וכן החיה, שנכנסה לחסר נזק וטרפה בהמה, ואכלה בשר משלם נזק שלם, or a wild animal that I own, I own a, whatever, a lion, and it goes into your private domain, and it kills and eats a, one of your little sheep there. I also have to pay full amount because that's the way of the wild animal to eat meat. Um, so both of those cases, each one according to what it usually eats. And similarly in these cases where an animal is eating something, it's not like this number one preferred food, but these are things that it would eat if there's nothing else around. A cow eats barley or a donkey that eats uh, 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 vetches. Um, it does that sometimes. A dog that licks oil or pig that eats meat, eats meat, even though these are not the most common things it eats. Uh, uh, but since it eats it, you know, uh, it would eat it if it needs to. These are also called um, fitting to eat and therefore is considered normal. That's the end of the Braita. And our Papa is going to now comment on, expand on some other cases. Amar Papa, Hashta Dambart, Kol Midi Delav Orchev Achala Lea Al Yedeha Dehak Shemei Achila. So what Israel Papa says, what I can derive from this Braita is that things that an animal doesn't normally eat, but it would eat it if it's under duress, there's nothing else, no other food around, um, uh, that, uh, that, that is considered still fitting to eat. So look at these two examples. If a cat eats dates or a donkey eats fish, you still have to pay the full amount. A cat usually eats meat, doesn't generally eat fruit, fruits or vegetables, but it would eat it if you really needed to. Uh, domesticated cats especially um, sometimes eat, uh, eat, some, eat fruits and vegetables. A donkey is usually herbivorous, um, but if you really needed to, it might eat fish. So therefore, one is still liable to pay a full amount as long as it's something that it would eat if it really needed to. Uh, but if it was something that it would, no way it would possibly eat, then that would be considered the same as it eating through clothes or eating through vessels. Uh, there was a case of a donkey that ate some bread, and while it's eating the bread, it also broke the basket. The basket, the bread was in the basket, and so it caused damage to both things. It came, the case came to Rav Yehuda, and he said uh, the owner of the donkey has to pay full uh, amount for the bread because it, that's a normal thing for it to eat, and it has to pay half nezek for the for the basket because that's unusual. Um, a, a donkeys don't usually go around and break baskets, and so therefore that would be like keren, unusual, and therefore only have to pay chatsi nezek. Ve'amai, we ask why. Kevan dorche lemechal nahama, orche na melafasu le sala. We say it really should be payment, full payment for both of them since it's ways to eat bread, and the bread is in the basket, so it's actually acting in a normal way when it breaks the basket because since it's normal for it to eat the bread and part of the process of eating the bread in the basket is going to be inevitably breaking the basket because it can't get the bread out so carefully um, so that should be considered it's all, it's all it's acting normally this whole time when it eats the bread and breaks the basket so you should have to pay the full amount for the basket and the answer is da'achal v'hadar pales I was talking about a case where it was two steps first he ate the bread and finished and then maybe he's looking for some more bread or whatever, or he's walking away and he breaks the basket. And, um, and so that's, that's unusual. If he did it while he's eating in the process, then this is all part of the process of a normal act. Um, but if he finished eating and then breaks the basket, that's weird. Why did he break the basket after that? So that would be the same as goring and we'd only have to pay half. Upat or Chehu, hold on. Even for a donkey, does it usually eat baked bread? Um, you know, we use grains and stuff, but does it eat baked bread? Or mean who? Achla patu basar vetabshil meshalem nezek shalem. My lab bebehema. We have a braita. If, if some kind of animal eats bread and uh, meat and a cooked dish, you only pay half because these are unusual foods. Is it not talking about a domesticated animal? And it teaches that, it shows that domesticated animals do not generally 
really eat cooked bread. This is law bechaya. No, it's talking about a wild animal. That's why wild animals don't eat bread. They don't like anything made out of uh, grains and vegetables. Wait, chaya basadur chehu. But if it's a uh, wild animal, then what's wrong with the? Uh, why was? Why is it only pay half for eating meat? Wild animals eat meat. Uh, de meat ve. We're talking about where it's roasted, right? Wild animals like raw meat. Then they don't like the roasted meat. Vi ma be tavya. Or uh, maybe it's talking about a deer. Deer, although they're wild animals, are herbivorous, and that's why. That uh, it wouldn't want, it wouldn't normally eat the meat, so it's only chasi nezek. Or we could go back to the original saying it is in fact a, a domesticated animal, but it ate it on the table. Usually domesticated animals, that, that table is for human food, they know, and they stay away from the table. And that was came right up to the table and ate it. So it is, even though it might usually eat bread, it wouldn't usually eat bread while it's on the table, and therefore chasi nezek. A goat saw a turnip on top of a barrel. It climbed up to get the turnip. It ate the turnip and, in the meantime, broke the barrel. And so Rava said, you have to pay for the turnip, full cost, and also you have to pay for the barrel, full cost. We ask, my tama, why, why should you have to pay? I mean, the turnip, we understand, it eats turnips, um, but it's unusual for a goat to break a barrel, so that should be chasinezek. And the answer is, Since its way is to eat turnips, so it's, 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 um, its normal way also is to climb up, if it needs to, to get the turnip. Therefore, when, it, when we talk about the usual or unusual activity and, uh, and usual or unusual food, it's not just the food itself or the activity by itself. You look at the entire scenario. If you take a typical goat and, take, um, and put it in, the, in that scenario of a turnip on top of a, a, a barrel, what would it do, a normal goat do? It would normally climb up and get, the, and get it. And so since it's normal behavior for it to do, if it's in a shoot anizak, um, they one would have to pay the full amount. This is an expected behavior, and since it's expected behavior, the owner should know. Yeah, this is going to do that, and you so you should know that your animal would do that, and therefore you have to be more careful. You you deserve to pay a full amount. Um, uh, we only say you pay chasi, you only pay uh, chasi nezek if it's something unusual, and the owner could say, well, I didn't expect it would do that. Um, if it's just a, a barrel with nothing on it, so then the goat, it's not unlikely that it would go and uh, break a barrel, so since they're there, the owner could say he didn't expect it, only then he pays the half amount. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.